It's a joy to once again host Dr. Daniel Hinshaw for another reflection, this time on the very important subject of pain and suffering. I'd like to just, for those who are tuning in with us now, do a short introduction once more of Dr. Hinshaw, who is an Orthodox Christian layman and professor emeritus of surgery at the University of Michigan School of Medicine and a consultant in palliative medicine at the University of Michigan Geriatric Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan, here in the U.S. of A. He has taught palliative care at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary in Yonkers, New York, and to medical professionals and clergy in international settings, including Ethiopia, Uganda, Serbia, Romania, and Lebanon. For several years, he has served as a visiting professor at Transylvanian University in Romania and at the St. John of Damascus Theological Institute and St. George's University Hospital at the University of Balamond in Lebanon. He's also the author of more than 80 papers published in scientific journals and volumes of collected works and the author of several books directly relevant to our theme. Dr. Hinshaw, it's a joy to have you with us. Oh, it's a joy for me to be here. Thank you, Father. Will you continue uh, down this road that you've been taking? Uh, in our previous discussion, we meditated under your guidance on the significance of being a human being, answering the question, who am I? Today, we're addressing the question, pain and suffering, are they the same? Are they? I think that's a fundamental question. It's, it's interesting. Uh, all of us are probably familiar with uh, either in fiction or in uh, accounts of uh, court trials and so forth, where a lawyer would typically talk about their client's pain and suffering. So there's a distinction even in the legal system. Last time we were talking about a holistic kind of perspective on the human person. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And I wanted to present here a couple of, of uh, examples, because I think this is sometimes the most useful way to look at, at and particularly for this session, I want to give the listener a, a chance to have something very practical that they can take away from the session. And so I'm going to present two different scenarios. The first scenario is a young woman, a 23-year-old woman, who is experiencing 10 over 10 intensity pain during uncomplicated childbirth. Now, what do I mean by 10 over 10 pain? If any, uh, many of us have, I'm sure, but if you've never been in the hospital where they nurse has come and asked you to rate your pain, uh, the typical scale that's used is between zero, no pain, and 10 being the worst pain you could imagine. Uh, and for this young woman, she's never experienced anything worse than the pain of childbirth. This is her first baby, and it's an extraordinarily uh, intense experience and, uh, to the point where she's at times crying out in pain, especially when the labor pains become their most intense. Uh, now, so the question then is, is she suffering and is pain equivalent to suffering? And I would suggest that we try to make a distinction between those two concepts because I'm gonna pose a third question here. And that is what if the obstetrician, if the physician taking care of her comes in with a worried uh, expression on her face and, and expresses anxiety about the safety of the baby. They've been doing some monitoring and uh, there's some concerns that perhaps the baby may be experiencing some distress and maybe uh, they would even be forced to do an emergency cesarean section, an operative delivery rather than a normal uh, type of uh, delivery that would typically occur. What happens to her pain then? So this is this is the, the question I'm raising. And I the reason I, raise this is I think it's important to make a distinction between intensity of pain and uh, another aspect of it, which I'll get into more detail in a minute, uh, the affective or emotional aspect of pain. And so affective, uh, or sometimes we use in the medical literature, the term unpleasantness, the unpleasantness of the pain is related to more of what the pain means to that person at that moment in time. But you could imagine that uh, even though she's you know, screaming at times in pain, but everything seems to be going well with the delivery, uh, she may be thinking, you know, I think I can bear this. It's not going to be uh, like this forever. 
And hopefully within a few minutes to hours, I'll be holding a healthy baby in my arms. And that's sustaining her through this experience. But when the doctor comes in and starts to express anxiety or concerns about the baby's welfare, what does that do to the pain? It, it's some, it may bring into the equation a different perception, uh, which is more at the emotional level where she's beginning to think, well, is, is all of this pain for naught? Am I going to lose my baby? And so the pain uh, starts to take on uh, a texture to it that is deeper and, and more uh, complex. And that's when the pain has this affective component to it, we're getting closer, I would say, to the notion of suffering. Now, let's look at the next uh, slide, which is a different example. So this is a, an older woman, a 65-year-old woman who has fortunately for a while been in remission following treatment for lung cancer. But now she presents with recurrent pain in her chest of four to five over 10 intensity. So it's moderate pain. It's pain that she might even be able to potentially fall asleep at night, but it's, it's there. She's aware of it when she's awake. Uh, but what's the important thing is that this is exactly the same pain that she had when she was first diagnosed with her cancer. And so now the pain is also associated with meaning. So, so rather than just the, the question, the sort of abstract question of, okay, how intense is the pain? What is the pain? Where is it located? What does it have in term, uh, meaning for me in terms of my past history? And so even though she may not be in anywhere near the amount of physical intense pain that the young lady having a baby is, she may be uh, experiencing intense suffering because that pain to her may very well mean that her cancer has come back and that she's uh, looking at her death. So this is the, the distinction I'm trying to make between pain intensity, especially, and, and pain, the sort of affective or deeper emotional aspect of pain that relates to the meaning of the pain for the person uh, and how that second type of aspect of pain is closer to the issue of suffering. The next slide, please. So I'm going to give you a, a medical definition. This is from the International Association for Study, the Study of Pain. Uh, and it's a durable definition, and it kind of relates to what, what I've just been talking about. Pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory, and I highlighted here, emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. In other words, people may have what looks like normal uh, physical findings, but they're experiencing pain that, that for them feels like there's some kind of major tissue damage going on. Or they may have tissue damage from trauma or from uh, a tumor that's growing or some other kind of in, uh, injurious agent uh, that is visible that's also experiencing uh, experiences pain. So pain is a very complicated phenomenon that is experienced uh, primarily at a subjective level. So the, and the other part of this uh, equation, I guess we have to be careful about, is that since pain is a subjective, we have to trust the person telling us that they're in pain. I mean, we may look at maybe an X-ray study, or you know, a, C, a computerized tomography scan, or or some other kind of uh, physical findings that would say, yeah, you should be in pain, and you might be surprised. They may say, well, I'm not in that much pain. Or they, or they may not show much of anything on all these imaging studies and tell you that they're in terrific pain. And so this is something that um, when we're teaching uh, medical students and nurses and, and uh, doctors in training, we have to remind them that these kinds of experiences are subjective and we need to uh, trust the report of the individual. Now, obviously, we can sometimes be fooled. Maybe somebody is actually... Uh, you know, drug seeking, but I would say that in my experience, that the, the drug seeking person is actually very rare. Uh, we, you know, and and as Christians, of course, I think we should always start from the perspective of of trusting and and being open to hearing the other person's story. The next slide, please. So this comes back now to these two components that I've been talking about: intensity. That's typically what you might be asked if you were admitted to the hospital. How strong is the pain? And they'll typically use an, a number-related scale or some other kind of scale like that. 
But the affective part, the how unpleasant is it, is something that tracks differently. So some people can say, well, there, it's not that unpleasant, but it is very intense. Uh, and so, as I said, I think it really, that emotional or affective component more closely aligns with the uh, concept of suffering. Next slide, please. So just to kind of summarize some other aspects of, or, or factors, I should say, that play into this emotional component of pain. That, uh, so the context of the pain is very cru uh, crucial, as I mentioned, the pain of childbirth, uh, as we've already talked about, uh, versus somebody suspecting that their cancer is recurring. Uh, the uncertainty associated with the pain is a very powerful thing. We live with uncertainty all the time. Uh, more or less, we wouldn't be able to function in this world. We, we get in, you know, we get into our automobile to go to our work. Uh, it's a dangerous thing, but we, we take these risks, uh, assuming that we're going to be okay. Uh, and the same thing with, with, um, our health where we have to live with a fair amount of uncertainty, but when it comes to pain, not knowing what the pain is, uh, what the source of the pain is or, or what its meaning is can be a great source of suffering over time. So even if it's very intense pain, let's say the young woman is now in labor for over 24 hours, it, her pain uh, is shifting to something that's more akin to suffering because of, well, when is this going to end? You know, how is this going to end? And so on. And then the accompanying that uncertainty is the, is the fear often that the pain may not be controllable. Is, is it, can it be controlled? The next slide, please. And the other thing is, of course, um, when we're in the midst of all this distress and maybe we don't present with any objective findings that a physician can kind of, you know, link to and, and endorse, there's a fear that, well, perhaps our professional caregiver will abandon us because uh, they don't believe we're really in pain or, or they can't or they're not sure. Um, and as I mentioned, chronic unremitting pain, even if it's of a low intensity, uh, it gradually eats away at, at a person. And maybe they're not crying out in pain, but, they, but it starts to produce symptoms that are in many respects similar to chronic depression. And finally, I think if we observe the pain of another person, uh, that can be a source of suffering in the other. So I think, and this is, I, we'll come back to this concept of co-suffering a little bit later. I think it's really important uh, to remember this, especially uh, this is something we I think are called to as Christians to be compassionate. And so if we take the risk of loving another person, we will likely suffer at some point. Uh, for a variety of reasons, maybe maybe because the person will disappoint us, maybe we'll lose uh, a loved one that we've invested so much uh, of our own concern and care for. But by the same token, if we don't exercise this capacity for love, we're not really fully human. Next slide. Could I ask you a question about that, Dr. Hinshaw? As you that last comment that you made there about about a whole nother dimension of suffering associated with love uh, and co-suffering made, made me feel that you're, you're moving past uh, physiology here. You're moving into the spiritual realm. And I'm wondering if you might comment a little bit about uh, pain of conscience. You know, the, one of the most commented on by the church fathers aspects of human suffering in this life is the torment of conscience, which often manifests itself in the body. So you might say, I'm thinking out loud, you might say, not just if you love, you'll suffer, but also if you sin, you'll suffer. What do you think about yeah. that? No, I think you're right. I mean, I think that, um, you know, some of the work that's been done in the secular medical literature related to this uh, has work that has been done by uh, medical chaplains, especially in the military. So they made a, a distinction between uh, the much better known post-traumatic stress disorder or what was called shell shock in World War I, where people are shaken up so much that they're emotionally not functional, uh, that there's another component of this that may or may not be uh, the dominant feature of it, and that is moral distress. So in other words, there, if you've seen or participated in horrific acts, uh, 
you're wounded by this and you suffer. And I think it reminds it reminds me of some of the early, I think, canons in the fourth century, I believe, of the church where uh, Roman soldiers who were Christians uh, were, you know, but of necessity ended up killing or injuring other people in the in the performance of their duties as a soldier. Uh, not an ideal situation, obviously, when you consider the, you know, the prescription against killing, but at the same time, they were caught in this situation. And I think there was, uh, within the economy of the church, a period of, of time where they were uh, excommunicated or taken out of, out of communion with the church, but as a, as a healing act, not as a, not as a punishment. But recognizing how that that there is this moral injury, and it and it is very much a, a type of suffering. But incredible, you know, it makes me. Think. I, I had an okay. experience uh, in my earlier pastorate when I was a younger priest that really impacted me with regards to how central and absolutely determinative of uh, peace or no peace attending to the pain of conscience was when I, I was once I was working at my desk and my secretary received a call and said, father, you're needed with an emergency. I immediately hung up uh, what I was doing and I took the call and it was uh, a friend of mine, not a parishioner uh, who was several hours distance from me, who was uh, evidently at, I found out in the, was dying in the hospital, but asked the nurse to call, and begged me to come, drop what I was doing, and come immediately. I was quite shocked. I was quite shocked. And I drove to the hospital. I had a very difficult time finding it. I had never been there before. And I finally made my way to his room, and there was a nurse waiting with her eye out for me because he was in a bed dying. And she said, please come, please come. I came. He shut the door, and he told me that he knew that he was dying that day, and that uh, it was about to happen, and that he couldn't bear dying without making a confession to me, and that for some reason I was the only person he felt he could do that to. And I heard his confession. He thanked me, he kissed my hand, and he died. Yeah. It absolutely, um, it was so sublime. The nature of his suffering was so intense here he was physically dying of something else, but the real death he was afraid of, the real torment in his life, that, that which was beyond pain and was true suffering was this which he had been unnecessarily carrying uh, in his conscience. Uh, and thank God it was able to, to be excised and uh, cleansed. But I've never thought that. I've never forgotten that. When I, when I read the fathers about the pain of conscience, I think of that circumstance. Yeah, I, later in our uh, in this uh, maybe in this talk or the next one, we I have a slide I think that speaks beautifully to that uh, from one of the early fathers. It talks about the distinction between what we do in the medical profession. I think that the job of the physician, or at least a Christian physician, is to help prepare a person physically so that they're able to not be so distracted by their physical distress, whether it's pain or some other kind of difficult symptom, so that uh, at least for the dying Christian, that they can concentrate on, on, on these deeper issues, on preparing for death on, and on their repentance. I mean, that's, of course, the admonition, you know, to remember our death. Yeah, that's an extraordinary, thank you for sharing that. That's a very powerful um, uh, example of, of this uh, moral distress uh, or, or the deep, profound suffering that is on an existential or spiritual level, uh, which, you know, because we are creatures of the earth, uh, that distress though, I've seen that kind of distress expressed physically too. I mean, they're, they're not, they're not separated. Uh, but what's amazing is that the, the spirit is so strong sometimes that people will hold on. I, and I've seen this other times where, where they, where they, uh, they're able to, you know, hold on to the, on this side of the grave, uh, until they can hopefully, uh, re, re receive some relief of their deeper distress. So I wanted, this is a picture of Eric Cassell, who died recently, uh, but he's a, a really one of the pioneers in, in American medicine, uh, 
exploring this issue of what suffering is. And I heard him speak once, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in person, and I had a chance to talk to him. And he, he, he was a Jewish man, but he made, he made a statement that has stuck with me for all these years. And, and he said that even as a Jewish person, he said that the most compelling image for him of human suffering was Christ on the cross. So I think that that's something to we can appreciate, you know, of course, as Christians, but I think it's it's even our non-Christian brothers and sisters, uh, if they have an open heart, they can see that as well. Uh, he defines suffering as a state of severe distress associated with events that threaten the intactness of the person. So he's very concerned about it's a person who suffers. It's not a, you know, it's not your gallbladder or your liver or your GI tract or some part of your body. It's it's the whole person. And she was very uh, uh, emphatic about that. And I think that was an important uh, emphasis that he placed on that, that has gradually seeped into medical uh, thinking. And, and, um, and so if that sense of impending destruction is not relieved, then the suffering, of course, can become very intense. Next slide, please. Another perception of this, I think, was is a very interesting piece that was written in the legal literature, uh, the Hastings Law Journal, many years ago, um, by a legal philosopher. But he was actually uh, reflecting fairly profoundly on the Book of Job, and so this was his definition: uh, to constrain, humble, or crush the will is the very core of what is classically meant by suffering. Uh, and of course, when we think about a, a culture where we are so focused on our autonomy and uh, independence, I think that uh, Professor Fingeret got that right. I mean, he, he really is speaking to the late 20th and even early 21st century here. To suffer then is, is to endure that over which our will has no power, that which is against our will. To suffer is to be the patient not the agent. In fact, I, that's really exercising patience implies suffering, doesn't it? Next slide. And of course, this is uh, Cicely Saunders' concept of the total pain, the, the, the four different dimensions of the human person who suffers. And, and like the, the gentleman that you were able to get to before he died, uh, his physical, in fact, the other three dimensions uh, physical, psychological, and social, took a back seat until his spiritual could, uh, could be addressed. And then, he could, and then he could actually let go. Next slide. So then I, there's a, a way of kind of thinking about these different dimensions. Um, so if you think of the Venn diagram here, you can see that, that there are interlocking elements between physical and psychological and social and I would argue that wherever those three are inter, where there's an interface between those three, there's usually, if you scratch the surface deeper, there's a spiritual element. So if an individual has unresolved spiritual or social or psychological distress, that's going to make their physical pain a lot worse and, and maybe even unresponsive to massive amounts of, of pain relievers. But if you have integrity, in those realms, uh, especially in the spiritual aspect, I've seen people uh, need very little pain medication. So it's really quite striking. I mean, everybody's different, but and and I firmly believe in the in the appropriate use of pain medications when when they uh, can be applied to help relieve distress. But this is just a sort of a general statement that that sometimes, um, if if a person's been receiving adequate pain relief, and then things get worse, you certainly need to think about their condition. Is their physical condition deteriorating? But it may be something deeper that's going on besides that, but being expressed through the physical. Because in our culture, uh, most of our distress is experienced in physical terms, uh, and that's uh, and we're not usually a, attuned to our deeper spiritual level, especially in a, in a highly secular world. Next, next slide, please. Now, Cassell went on and, and made a point here, I think that's really important to remember about modern medical thinking, and there's a dichotomy here. So the Greek word for suffering, pathos, in modern usage, it's been uh, linked to pathology, which is 
usually defined as the study of disease, whereas it should be the the, the word that should be used is nosology, nosos is disease in Greek. Uh, and so you can see what this kind of leads to, though. And here's, I'm quoting Cassell, doctors pursue symptoms because of the belief that they are the direct manifestations of disease. And in fact, diseases are the real things, the things that count. Sick persons as persons are an agglomeration of soft data, feelings, emotions, values, and beliefs, and these terms not as real as their diseases. And it's, and it's also, unfortunately, at least until very recently, physicians were never even trained to address those, quote, soft data. Next slide. Now, I want to just give some, a little bit of practical introduction uh, for our listeners, because I think this is so important where there, here's an opportunity actually where the secular world in many respects is consistent or at least acceptable, I think, from a Christian standpoint. So the World Health Organization has defined palliative care as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psycho, uh, psychosocial, and spiritual. Now, I would beg to differ a little bit with the definition because I think su I think suffering is an ontological problem. I think, in other words, it's something that's a state of our being. It's it's because we, and I'll come into this later uh, from a, a Christian theological standpoint, but I think relieving distress to the extent that medicine can is a good thing. It's it, because there's plenty of suffering still behind it. Next slide, please. So palliative care then uses a multidisciplinary team, which, which is kind of an unusual thing for physicians to be trained with. We have to learn how to do this because we often act like the lone ranger thinking that we can solve every problem when we really need to humbly, uh, work within a team of individuals who have different perspectives to bring to the care of the person uh, who is suffering. And I think the, the last bullet there I wanted to really emphasize, palliative care is appropriate whenever there is suffering. And that's typically in a life-threatening illness, but it, it may be even in the early earliest stages of the treatment of the illness, uh, it's when you're still trying to prolong life or even affect a cure, there is no reason why we can't also make the treatment itself, which is so difficult sometimes, have so many side effects, more bearable. Uh, in other words, it doesn't go in, it's not at war with curative medicine. Next slide, please. And this is a, uh, a diagram to show that. So if you look at the kind of purple uh, triangle uh, above, at the very beginning of a diagnosis, when somebody is presented with a really bad news that they have a cancer or some serious life-threatening illness, most of the focus tends to be toward curing that illness. But if you can also introduce at that same moment a discussion about, we're also going to accompany you through this illness, we're going to do everything we can to make the, the symptoms that occur either from the treatment or the disease itself as bearable as possible so that you have the best quality of life. Uh, it establishes a certain level of trust, in, and especially in emphasizing if things don't work out so that we can make it go away for good and forever, so to speak, uh, we're not going to abandon you. We're going to be with you throughout this illness, uh, even if there are no more treatment options directed at cure, we're still going to care for you. And you can see a, a stippled line there with the label hospice. That's a, that's a U.S. convention because the Medicare hospice benefit kicks in at when physicians prognosticate that there's six months or less to live. Palliative care and hospice in most of the world are essentially um, equivalent terms, almost syn synonymous. But in the U.S., because of the hospice Medicare benefit, there is this uh, distinction. And the other important aspect of this, of course, and I think this is very consonant with an orthodox understanding, is that the care of the person and those who love that person doesn't end at the at the time of the person's death. They, there, there is an effort made even in any decent hospice. They should provide bereavement support, uh, grief counseling, whatever is uh, necessary. Uh, this is, of course, in a secular context. Um, to at least one month beyond the first anniversary, so 13 months after the death. 
And of course, in the Orthodox Church, we have memorial services that go on, uh, you know, for as long as people remember to do them. So it's it's a so there, there's an opportunity here, I think, to uh, add an or, a much deeper, profounder understanding of these uh, services uh, to the fundamental hospice kind of approach. And I think part of this is not an accident because I think I may have mentioned this before, but Cicely Saunders was a close friend of Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, and he clearly had an influence on her approach philosophically to these uh, activities. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, hospice is a philosophy of care. In the United States, it's defined under as a benefit under Medicare Part A. Uh, and it has really one of the most comprehensive home health services available for persons deemed by physicians to have six months or less to live. Now, with children, recently, I think the program has expanded so that they can have hospice-type services even when they're still having active uh, treatment for the disease beyond the six-month uh, window. Uh, so that's something I hope will happen with adults as well in the future. But it includes nursing, social services, nurses' aides, physician oversight, volunteers, and, and a, cha a hospital chaplain of a generic sort uh, who provide uh, durable, and there's also durable medical equipment for the home. So it's a very comprehensive service, but one that can also, uh, and if it's a good hospice, they will work very closely with whatever the spiritual care provider is for that person. So they, they should be very respectful, for example, of Orthodox traditions and uh, working with the Orthodox uh, priest that's uh, connected to that family. Next slide. Dr. Hinshaw, so let me just say yeah, just one thought. You know, what you just said about the, um, the approachability and the willingness to collaborate with hospice between hospice and and clergy that has been my experience so happily uh, I, most of our people now over the years uh, have witnessed such an incredible collaboration between hospice and our parishioners who are are blessed to be able to get out of the hospital and be cared for often in their own homes with hospice care and then in our parish about 20 years ago we started uh, a burial society, uh, a group of people who were who were trained in basic care um, and worked work very closely with hospice and visit the person and read prayers to the person and uh, help them make arrangements for the end of their life, help them to secure a coffin and to decide where they're going to be buried, and also kind of work as a liaison between the person hospice and the priest to make sure that they get regular visitations. It has been just a, a heavenly cooperation. And I've never had a single bad experience with a hospice nurse. Oh, thank Not God. No, I, uh, just an interesting demographic. I mean, I don't think it may have changed somewhat, but in the Oh, in the 2000 to 2010 period, the, about the middle of the way of the, through that, maybe 2005 or six, there was a survey done, a national survey, and, and the vast majority, well over 50% of hospice nurses in the United States were Roman Catholic. So they were, they were serious uh, uh, Catholic uh, believers who were very concerned about the sanctity of life. Unfortunately, at the same time, even at that point, physicians who were in, working in hospice were often unchurched. And so I think this is, yeah, uh, and, and it's probably gotten worse. Uh, a lot of them are very caring, uh, secular humanists uh, and good people, but it, they, I think, are without, a, without any kind of grounding in terms of understanding about the, the longstanding prohibitions against uh, taking human life and so forth. And, and, and we'll get into this more in the future, uh, future conversation about how suffering is so connected to ethical behaviors. Uh, unfortunately, if suffering becomes the great you know, enemy, then, then all things are permissible. So th this is something that hospice nurses, I still think have a um, almost a built-in instinctive aversion to most of them. And, and so they're holding together uh, the older tradition of hospice uh, to this day at this point. But, 
but as as uh, practices change at the medical at the physician level, uh, it's it's we're coming to some kind of a day of reckoning, unfortunately. Yeah. You know so this we, uh, the great oh. gift, the great gift of God to the church in these last days of Saint Porphyrios of Capso Calivia. Yeah, has rung his his witness to the heavenly ministry of nurses. He called, he, you know, he was a chaplain at a hospital uh, in Athens for, time, yeah. for decades, and yeah, and he considered the nurses in their in their white outfits to literally be angels in the flesh, <laughs> uh, uh, performing a divine service uh, for those who were suffering in the body. That has been my point of reference for dealing with the hospice nurses in uh, Riverside County. It's been a, it's been like that. Yeah. There's something very sad. I, I just, as an aside, I'll just say this is true for physicians, but also even for the nursing profession, the more education we get, the further away we are from touching people. And so, and, and the irony of this is that the, the people who do the most direct personal care, the, the, you know, the thing that really Christ spoke of so much in the gospels uh, the certified nurses as aides, and, and they're, they're very special people. They are paid the least, and they can almost not make a living wage. And so this is a real crime in our country, unfortunately. I mean, there, I, could, I could see a lot of uh, people, probably orth Orthodox, who would be really called or feel moved to this kind of service, but they also need to be able to feed their families and so on. So there has to probably be something that the church itself, would, you know, collectively would set up or endow, because I don't think uh, the way things are reimbursed, at least at present in healthcare, this service, which is, I, as far as I'm concerned, is the greatest service, uh, it, is not uh, rewarded appropriately. Yeah. So getting back to the slides, the, the, just to emphasize, hospice goes through two certification periods of three months each, but people can be in hospice indefinitely. Uh, if the question is, at each end of those, quote, quote, certification periods, uh, either a licensed independent practitioner, that would be a nurse practitioner or a physician, has to reevaluate the person and say their likely prognosis at this moment in time is still less than six months, and, and then every 60 days after that first six months. And if the person still looks for all intents and purposes like they're declining at that rate, they could be in hospice for years sometimes, and appropriately so. Uh, sometimes people graduate out of hospice and they can go back into hospice as they, as they need that, the, you know, if their functional state declines. Uh, and and uh, I can witness to this directly because my own father uh, benefited from hospice and then graduated and then later had to go back into hospice later before he died. And so this is, a, it's a wonderful service. Um, and it really is the most holistic uh, care that's offered. It's sad that it's only being offered typically toward the end of life because uh, it, it needs to, it's a good model for care throughout life. Next slide. Uh, I think we can, Okay, I think everything I mentioned here, the only other thing is that the DNR means do not resuscitate or attempt, I would say, do not attempt to resuscitate status. That's not a requirement for either of, the, of those, although some hospices would prefer that people sign so, such an order before they enter, but they legally, I don't think any state can demand that, certainly not from a Medicare standpoint. Uh, next slide. Now, this is my last slide, I think, for this this particular presentation. I just want to emphasize something here because a lot of people think that when you enroll in hospice, you give up, or if you or you get palliative care, you give up, and you're going to die faster. There was a, a fantastic study done, uh, published uh, by Jennifer Temmel and her colleagues at Harvard, uh, very well done a study, where they enrolled people who had basically incurable lung cancer the most and the most common form of lung cancer, uh, which has a lot of suffering associated with its treatment, but also the symptoms are, are pretty terrible. And so they were presenting at, at an advanced stage. They were not going to be able to be cured. They would certainly get radiation or chemotherapy potentially to help them. And what they found out was that the people who were enrolled in palliative care at the very beginning, I mean, others could choose often, you know, sort of in a random fashion when they wanted it, but the ones who signed up at the very beginning of their diagnosis 
they not only had less depressive symptoms, they lived longer. It was almost like they got a better chemotherapy. <laughs> they wow. were, yeah. I mean, 11.6 months versus 8.9 months. That's quite a significant improvement in survival for something that is a really, really tough disease. And I think part of it is, is that the answer to the, is less aggressive therapy is translates into more survival and better quality of life. So if a person is ill from the treatment, they're not going to live as long and they're going to be spending a lot of precious time uh, away from their family, away from prayer, uh, pursuing, you know, another week or two of survival and actually may, may not get that. They may, they may actually do better with less. So yes. um, that's been a landmark study. And that out of that study, uh, even the uh, National American Society for Clinical Oncology, that, that is the large group, uh, organization for oncologists, cancer specialists, uh, recognized that they needed to endorse palliative care as a part of st the standard of cancer care. So that's, uh, I just want to end on that note. It's, it's, so it's not giving up. It's just giving appropriate care. You know, but the, the thing underlying all of that is a recognition that you know we are mortal you know which yes. is which that's not a very yes. popular notion but we are mortal creatures. no the, the embrace of mortality uh yeah. is so necessary to be able to make a decision not to take the unnecessary unhelpful more aggressive plan uh but if you're absolutely paranoid of death and you've made no preparations for it and it hasn't been a, a subject of your meditation uh as christ has taught us to make it, then you want to do anything just to stave off the possibility of dying. And I'm wondering, just, that's a, a great segue, good doc, to a, a conversation that, that you've promised to make with us uh, in future discussions on the subject of suffering and death. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that. We can... Can you, before we go, could you could you answer one question? Actually, two two quick questions. One is, can you help myself and the readers know the etymology of palliative care? Why is palliative care called palliative care? That's very interesting. I'm glad you asked that because the uh, the person who coined the term is still, I believe, alive, and he's uh, his name is Bel Fremont. He was a uro urologist, but a, a cancer surgical cancer cancer specialist involving. Uh, urologic disease uh, in Montreal. And, and because Montreal is a French-speaking part of Canada, the word hospice doesn't quite relate to, to well, uh, in, in French. It doesn't mean quite the same thing. And so he coined the term soin palliative. And, and of course, palliative uh, comes from a Latin word pallium, which was a cloak that apparently Romans wore. And so this idea is that the, the palliative is, is something that cloaks distress. It, it, it covers it. And so it has, it has kind of a nice metaphor, a sense in, uh, of being protected, but also, you know, like, and I, I like to think of it from an Orthodox standpoint as sort of the sash of the Theotokos. You know, it's a, oh, so, so nice. palliative care. That, that's how the, so the, it came from a, a, an accommodation to French linguistic needs. And my second question following up on that is, is the trajectory in the United States, in the West, maybe in general, in embracing, embracing palliative care, is it a, a positive? Are we seeing more and more uh, medical communities embracing the value of this? I think so. I mean, I certainly the enrollment of people who are, you know, like looking at Medicare decedents, you know, people who have died who are enrolled in Medicare, uh, I think at the turn of the millennium, around 2000, there were only about 25% roughly. Uh, and, and now it's closer, I think, to about 50%. So certainly people, more people are using the Medicare hospice benefit. The sad part of that, uh, unless it's changed recently, in the, uh, certainly in the last three to five years, the data was showing that there are more people enrolled in hospice before they die, but the period of enrollment in hospice is very short. So it's like they get that last round of chemotherapy and the, everybody's done with their care. They're dying in the ICU and they want to go home. And so they get them home barely and then they die at home in hospice after three days. It's, it's, it, that's like, in my mind, that's one of the worst kind of 
deaths to have. I mean, you're, you're sort of robbed of the full benefit of the hospice aspect yes. and you're, and you're, and you're getting treatment. And in fact, there are quality measures now in the, in the cancer, cancer specialists are now looking at quality measures. You know, if, if someone dies within two weeks of their last chemotherapy, that's a, that's a bad outcome. So they're beginning to acknowledge that, you know, we need to do a better job of prognosticating and we need to be start backing off of aggressive treatments. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the, we have a we have a healthcare system that is driven, like so much of our society, by financial considerations. It's very yes. profitable, and so that that's something we have to kind of face and and think about. Thank you very much for this uh, sublime reflection on pain and suffering, Doctor. Look forward to the next one. Okay. Hey everyone, God bless you. Mark your calendar. June 3rd to 5th, our annual Patristic Nectar Conference. You are going to be thrilled at the lineup. Here it is. Holy Orthodoxy, presenting the Christian faith. Go to our website and you can find out there how to participate either in person here with us in Riverside. We hope you'll come or by live stream if you can't come here yourself. God be with you. Looking forward to seeing you.